Okay, y'all. Today we're going to be talking about Thanatopsis by William Cullen Bryant. All right, Thanatopsis, that's a Greek word. Um, thanatos means death, and topsis means to see. So this poem, you might guess, is literally a vision of death. Vision of death, that's interesting. A couple of important background points. It was a romantic poem written at the age of 19. Got two parts to that sentence. It's a romantic poem. What the heck is that? Well, romanticism celebrates emotion over reason, individuality, and looks to nature. Okay, second part, age of 19. Teenagers are emotional. They're not rational. Uh, they're full of hope generally. Sometimes they're, you know, the opposite of hopeful. So we're going to look at that and in need of guidance. So we're going to see how this poem um, Mary's, we double up on the emotional here. Let's see what happens. All right, let's get into it. To him who in the love of nature holds communion with her visible forms, she speaks of various language. For his gayer hours, she has a voice of gladness and a smile and eloquence of beauty. And she glides into his darker musings with a mild and healing sympathy that steals away their sharpness ere he is aware, when thoughts of the last bitter hour come like a blight over thy spirit, and sad images of the stern agony, and shroud, and pall, and breathless darkness, and the narrow house make thee to shudder, go forth, or, and grow sick at heart, go forth under the open sky, and list to nature's teaching, while from all around earth and her waters and the depths of air comes a still voice. All right, first of all, y'all, before you can get into any analysis of a poem, you always have to look at the explication of the poem. What's the difference there? When we explicate a poem, we're just going to translate it from poetry into prose. We're going to get the basic summary, and we're going to identify any poetic elements in it. So first of all, nature its being personified, right? It's someone who you can speak to in various language, you can hold communion with, uh, so that's the main poetic element. You could call that the poetic conceit. Conceit is the main um, poetic device that's used throughout the poem. All right, let's get into the summary. So if you spend some time with nature, she's going to meet you where you're at. If you are happy, um, she'll have a voice of gladness. When you're sad, she will steer away, steal away the sharpness. Before you even know it, she'll make you feel better. And there's times when you simply have to contemplate on death. Death, all you 19-year-olds, all you 17-year-olds, all you 15-year-olds out there, um, just go forth. Listen into nature. Listen to her teachings. All right, so this we're going to look at this poem in four parts. That's the first part. And then second part. Yet a few days, and the all-beholding sh sun shall see no more in all his course nor yet in the cold ground where thy pale form was laid with many tears, nor in the embrace of ocean shall exist thy image. Earth that nourished thee shall claim thy growth to be resolved to earth again and lost to each human trace. Surrendering up thine individual being shalt thou go to mix forever with the elements, to be a brother to the insensible rock and to the sluggish clod which the rude swain turns with his share and treads upon, the oak shall send forth his roots abroad and pierce thy mold. All right. What? You're going to die soon. Um, soon your pale form will be laid in the cold ground. Huh. That's not very hopeful. Where's, where's, the, uh, where's the hope? When you die... You're going to lose your individuality. Everything that made you you is going to be gone. You're going to be one with the earth. Each human trace will be surrendered up. And you know what? An oak tree is probably going to grow where you were. All right. Um, where is that hopefulness that we were talking about? Let's keep reading. Yet not to thine eternal resting place shalt thou retire alone, nor couldst thou wish couch more magnificent. Thou shalt lie down with patriarchs of the infant world, with kings, the powerful of the earth, 
the wise, the good, fair forms, and hoary seers of ages past, all in one mighty sepulchre. The hills, rock-ribbed and ancient as the sun, the vale stretching in pensive quietness between, the venerable woods, rivers that move in majesty, and the complaining brooks that make the meadows green, and poured round all old ocean's gray and melancholy waste, are but the solemn decorations all of the great tomb of man. The golden sun, the planets, all the infinite host of heaven are shining on the sad abodes of death, though the still lapse of ages. All that tread the globe are but a handful to the tribes that slumber in its bosom. Take the wings of morning, pierce the bark in wilderness, or lose thyself in the continuous woods where rolls the organ and hears no sound, save his own dashings, yet the dead are there. And millions in those solitudes, since the first flight of the years began, have laid them down in their last sleep. The dead reign there alone. So shalt thou rest, and what if thou withdraw in silence from the living, and no friend take note of thy departure? All that breathe will share thy destiny. The gay will laugh when thou art gone, the solemn brood of care plod on, and each one, as before, will chase his favorite phantom. Yet all these shall leave their mirth and their enjoyments, and shall come and make their bed with thee. As the long train of ages glides away, the sons of men, the youth in life's green spring, and he who goes in the full strength of years, matron and maid, the speechless babe and the gray-haired man, shall one by one be gathered to, this, to thy side by those who in their turn shall follow them. Okay, so at least you won't be alone. Um, you're going to be with the greatest people who ever lived, with kings, with the powerful of earth. Turns out everyone's going to die. You know what? That's all nature is. It's the great tomb of man. It doesn't matter if you go out alone into the wilderness. You can pierce the wings of morning. Uh, you can fly like Apollo across the sky. Um, you can lose yourself in the continuous woods of Oregon. There's someone dead underneath your feet. Not only that. Your death's not going to change anything. The people who were happy before you died will still be happy. People who were sad before you died will still be sad. But in the end, they're going to join you. They're going to be with you. They are going um, to drop their employments and shall come and make their bed with you. One important thing to note here is that Brian his words are majestic. His words are adventurous. It sounds like he's describing this incredible adventure, but he's talking about death. People don't normally talk about death uh, in this way. So uh, that's, that's a device called contrast. He's contrasting his tone and his imagery with uh, his content. All right. So this is the last part of the poem. So live... So live, that when thy summons comes to join the innumerable caravan, which moves to that mysterious realm where each shall take his chamber in the silent halls of death, thou go not like the quarry slave at night, scourged to his dungeon, but sustained and soothed by an unfaltering trust, approach thy grave like one who wraps the drapery of his couch about him and lies down to pleasant dreams. Right. So don't live afraid of death. Death ought to be as comfortable as a blanket. So we read the poem, we've explicated the poem, but now we're going to move from explication to analysis. Analysis is where we look into how does the poem say what it says. Should we agree with it or not? And let's jump right in. So should you be afraid of death? No, at least not according to the poem. Right? Interestingly enough, it begins with talking about being in communion with nature while we're alive. But that's what it argues death is. Death is a communion with nature. 
We surrender up our individual being to become brother of the rock. But nature in that way sort of acts as unifying because it's not just nature that we commune, commune with in death. It is every other man who's ever lived. It is mankind. So let's look at how the author creates this um, idea that we shouldn't be afraid of death. Well, one way that Brian does it is through paradox. Okay, paradox. Paradox are two things that seem to be contradictory, but actually are not. Let's look at an example. When you go out alone to listen to the woods, you pierce the morning, or you fly the bark in wilderness, or you roll through the endless hills of Oregon, you would think you would be alone. No, actually, um, the dead are there. The poem repeats that line, the dead are there. So when you are alone in wilderness, you are not alone. Nature, it takes away the sharpness of death, but only by reminding you of its inevitability, by being a tomb, in fact, uh, by being the great sepulcher of mankind. Uh, so you go there to get away from death, and yet you find death. Right? And even in the um, subject matter, the more he talks about death, the more grandiose his tone becomes, the more fantastic imagery, this, this uh, imagery of a, of a wonderful sepulcher, this ar architectural masterpiece, the, the more he talks about death, the higher a tone he gets. Also interesting to note that he's using blank verse on rhymed iambic pentameter, um, which is Shakespearean. You know, Shakespeare was famous for using it. So it's this high um, language on this mean subject, the subject of death. So how does the tone or how does Brian create that tone? You know, if you you might want to go back and look at individual words and find the contrast between the individual words that he uses and the overall message that he's he's uh, presenting. And finally, should joining that great procession of humanity take away the fear of death? And that's the argument that Brian's making: is that because we are becoming one with nature, becoming one with uh, mankind, which he says how we ought to be living anyway, those in communion with nature. Because that's all death is, there's nothing to be afraid of. It ought to be comfortable. And then finally, look at this picture, look at this background. Do you see the tomb of man? Should we see the tomb of man? Something to ponder. All right, if you like that video, guys, go ahead and hit the like button, hit subscribe, and answer these questions down below. Do you see the tomb of man? I'm really curious.